came as a translator. Oh, you speak. Mm -hmm. And she and I were living together as much as you can live together when you sleep in hammocks with six other people and climb off a boat every night and tie them in the trees. But anyway, we were living together. But he was with us too. And he came. <laughs> it's hard to explain. There's a definite, there's a phenomenon happening in South America which, thank God, you don't meet in India. And it has to do with not religions. Uh, people, the New, the New Jerusalem, people who are generally fruititarian. And, uh, well, there's no way to put it except absolutely nuts. It's like a tribe of people who, since 1962 or 3, have been drifting down through Mexico you know, chiseling on each other, living with each other, hating each other, Drinking intrigues. Right. Mm -hmm. And at one time it was called what? The, 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 the Rainbow no. Family no. Peace? No. Something like that. Anyway, they communicated with these things called the beings of light, and they communicated with them through Ouija boards. And this whole <laughs> mythology was built up around around, I don't know, it's just very depressing to go into it. But anyway... Is that Mars Sector 6 in that? I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> Everyone is a reincarnation. For instance, there's one guy who thinks he's the reincarnation of Rasputin, <laughs> and, and named Robin. Another guy, <laughs> this guy who was, who was a refugee from the Hare Krishnites, who wears white robes and white rubber <laughs> boots. He's the reincarnation of Erwin Rommel. <laughs> Uh, and then the leader, right, the central mystery of this whole group was Sia, right, who was Kume's acquaintance. Well, no, it has to be told for the record. And he was very strange and believed that he was rein had been several prominent people reincarnated. And... Uh, I was in a funny place. I mean, my categories weren't too rigid. I just thought, happy. happy hippies. You know, we're all happy hippies. I've been in Asia. I don't know too much about how the universe is put together. You know, maybe there, maybe Atlantis existed. Who knows? I mean, it seems unlikely to me, but, you know, what do I know? But getting in with these people, it developed that there was... Insanity. Right, a lot of funny categories that couldn't be tolerated. Because Sia would, like, if he didn't want you to do something, he would just have a sort of a blank look for a minute and then announce that it had been revealed to him <laughs> on the instant by That's the beings funny. of light that you shouldn't uh, open tomato cans with knives or anything else. I mean, in other words, the last minutia of existence was uh, controlled by these hidden forces. <clears throat> right, and he had monkeys who had Christ incarnate in them. <laughs> and they traveled with animals. I mean, monkeys, dogs, kittens, and they insisted that all the animals be vegetarian. <laughs> so the animals, you know, were twisted and scrofulous and their eyes are going around in circles. And he's telling, you know, this is Buddha, this is Christ, this is Hitler. It wasn't actually this nuts, I'm exaggerating for purposes, but it was, you know, in his own head, it was this loose. Uh, we went down there. My brother was to join us. He was the impetus for the expedition. Well, you my Sarah, six. Michael, Kumi, Dennis, me, and six. Sia. Six. What we were looking for was we were very interested in tryptamine narcotics. And uh, it seemed from our experience that the problem with smoking DMT... Have you ever smoked it? Well... If you have the pure stuff, it's just in a sort of class by itself as an experience. And it seemed to us that there was something very useful to be learned in that dimension. But the stuff that we had always been exposed to, you get about a hundred seconds of flash. And then you're fighting your way down through level after level of shifting hallucination. You can't really make anything out of it. So we were saying, you know, we need a time in this dimension to figure out what's going on. Uh, 
So it happens that there's a tree, or a genus of trees, which grow in the New World Tropic called Varola. And there are about six species of these trees. And they're used as a, a resinous, the resin underneath the bark is used as arrow poison and snuff. And it's 5-methoxy and MDMT in large enough amounts to make it worth pursuing. And it has a fairly wide distribution over the Amazonic basin as an arrow poison and a snuff. But in this one area, there are three tribes of people, Witoto, Bora, mm -hmm. and Muinani, three language groups. It's just this outrageously isolated and hard to get to place. And they take the resin from this tree and they roll it in the ash of another tree and it's orally active. You can take it like a pill and it lasts a couple of hours. This was the, the yeah. rap, right? And the rap came from the hallucinogen and uh, written by Schultes, who's the man who's the New World, or the expert on New World narcotic plants. He had never seen this drug, which was called Ukuhe, he had just had it reported to him by this anthropologist named Horacio Calle, who was the only person, the only non-Indian person who had ever reported this narcotic. He taught at the University de los Andes in Bogota. So we inquired when we were in Bogota if he was there. They said, oh no, he's with his people. Right, he's with his people. So it turned out that his people were, in fact, Witoto, and they were about 110 kilometers from the village which was indicated as the center of this drug practice called La Chorera. So it was 12 days, 11, 10, 12, 15, who knows, days down the river, down the Putumayo River, six days from a place called Puerto Leguizamo, which Burroughs describes in the Yahe letters as looking like a town after a flood. And it's just nothing there, just stinking mud, corrugated tin shacks, tremendous heat, Lots awful, radio. awful, radios, filth, horrible. And that's the jumping off place. And you get a trading boat, which goes down these rivers, takes it four weeks or something to get to Leticia, 900 miles away, and you just go down these rivers. So we arrive right in this town where no one ever comes. One hotel, we arrive. Sia with Koa, the Kali who is Christ. Ron Rinello, the kitten who is Buddha, who has scurvy. Several monkeys of several species. Uh, Sarah awesome. Hartley with 150 tons of camera equipment. Uh, Michael Lasky, who is like a, a, the gay meditator. Right, a gay meditator, that was <laughs> his role. A maker of pottery, an embroiderer of blue <laughs> jeans, a happy flower child, right? Kume, Dennis, my brother, who had never been to a foreign country, he's 21 years old, he's the botanist, right? Uh, and about him you'll hear more later. So much, <laughs> so much more. <laughs> Sia, who hated my guts, we had, she had left him in St. Augustine and come to Bogota, where they had kindly said we could have their apartment. So in the week or two weeks where we were getting together equipment, why Kumi and I evolved a relationship, or the beginning of a relationship, which A, bummed Sarah Hartley outrageously. So there was a lot of karma about that, but it was all about, look, you know, I like this girl, and this was the clinching argument for all these other people. She speaks Spanish. Now, are you seriously suggesting that we trek 22 days into the Amazon basin <laughs> with no grip whatsoever on the local language? She has to come. So it was agreed that she would come. Meanwhile, Michael Lasky had telegrammed oh, Sia. He didn't know anything about what was going on. Telegrammed Sia, invited <laughs> him to meet us in Florencia and come with us to the Amazon basin. So we, get to the airport. we pile on this Air Force airplane and we land in Florencia, right? 
Michael, Sarah, Dennis, Kumi, and dog. I, her dog, and 10 tons of equipment, which is to be ported down the Amazon. Sia is at the airport waiting, mm -hmm. thinking that his girl, who he's lived with for three years, has gone to Peru with the guy in white <laughs> robes and the rubber boots, right? Actually, no. And so there's this fantastic freak out at the airport fence, which is all about, hi, Sia. Uh, <laughs> Kumi and I will take one room at the hotel, and, you, and it was just, you know, with there being no possibility of grace on anyone's part, telegraphing to him that since he had seen his lady last, her life space had been totally restructured and something else was going on. Well, I was freaking, but I'm sort of a milk toast in that I hate karma. And so I thought, you know, it was cool. So he came into our room and he said, well, it doesn't look like there's anything here for me. I think I'm going to fly to Bogota. And I thought, wow, thank God. wonderful, thank God. So then he went away and went into communion with the beings of light and came back two hours later and said, you know, you can't find it without me. You can't find it without me. That was his rap. You don't know anything about it. I'm a man, a of, man the of the forest. forest. He was into this really? image of himself as the man of the forest. So I said, mm, okay. So we'll fly to Puerto Leguizamo, right? That was the next jump. So we pile on an Air Force plane. And now we have him, his dogs, his cats. He was nuts. I mean, he wore robes, he, he had a staff, he had a staff, right, yeah, with blowing fajas. And uh, we get to Puerto Leguizamo, and I assumed, see, that the boats leave Puerto Leguizamo very irregularly, and I thought we would have to wait, like maybe even two weeks wouldn't be unusual to have to wait. And th this hotel is tiny, the food is terrible, and I figured, you know, we're just going to rub up against each other mm -hmm. and go ape shit, and then he'll go away and it'll be over with. Because he was being very unpleasant to her, and it was very strange karma for everyone involved. Because I actually had only been with her two, two weeks, and I thought, you know, these people have been together three years, they've been to the Orient together, you know, what is going on? And, uh, but it didn't happen that way. It turned out there was a boat tomorrow, right? And so within hours, this thing fell together and we paid the 600 rupees or pesos or whatever it was to go down the river and at dawn the next morning, piling all our animals, all, you know, cameras, e chings, butterfly nets, plant presses, formaldehyde, notebooks, PDB, Finnegan's Wake, all the things you must have to go into the Amazon base. We get on this, on this tiny trading boat, and they indicate that we are to have the area on top Where of the Coke bottles, is. right? There's a six <laughs> levels of Coke bottles with a tarp thrown over, and that's where we that's are to ride. And it's, he says, you know, well, it's six to twelve days to where we're going. <laughs> so you have to ride this. So down bottles. this boat, right? And we're smoking dope, and we're smoking dope. And Puerto Lake Isama disappears. And the river, and the green, and the, the parrots, and the biting insects, and the scream of the, the birds, and the brown water, and the jungle is just absolutely impenetrable, right? And by this time, everyone hates everyone else's guts for some reason or another. And Sarah and Sia, who had about as much in common as Hitler and Stalin, <laughs> are our buddy buddy because, you know, I've miffed Sarah because. She it turns out Diane was right, and there was a lot of hanky-panky going on in Canada, and now Sarah's about to forge the weld, and suddenly this other person appears, and it's not going well at all. And Dennis was just doing his trip. Michael was worrying about food. He was a chronic worrier. He was a, you know, a New York gay meditator. He had no business being in the Amazon basin, and he was just... He thought you took off your shoes yeah, and you go to your Indian <laughs> brothers and you want to learn the secrets of the forest and they say, come my son, come with us, you will learn the secrets of the forest. And when he actually was confronted with the Amazon jungle, he was freaking completely. It was at the end of a bug run. 
<laughs> Animals are falling off into the river once an hour. The captain of the boat hates our guts because we have to stop and drag these monkeys. soaking monkeys out of the uh, <laughs> So after six days, down the Putumayo River, which is the border between Colombia and Peru, we get to a place called El Encanto, which is a police, just a police outpost. Then we wanted to go up another river, which flows in there, the Caraparana. We wanted to go to Dr. Calle. We said this is the only Spanish-speaking or you know, English, the only English-speaking person who's ever dealt with this narcotic. He speaks Witoto. He's with his tribe. He, he is the only person who knows what it's like. We had a, a taxonomic plate of Varola Theodora. That was all we had. So we talked to the priest at this police station. He says, Dr. Kaye and his wife are with their tribe, and it's 40 minutes up the river. And he was horrified that we were there. Because, you know, we were, we looked like Haight-Ashbury hippies, and it was all about, you know, how did you get here? How did you live to get this far? So he poured, he didn't, he clearly didn't want us around the mission. <laughs> so he pours us in his speedboat, and we go tearing up this jungle river, which is now a river so so to hell and gone that you couldn't hardly expect to see anyone except Indians and very few of them. We go up the river for four, about 40 minutes, and he dumps us on a sandbank, and there's a path through the the jungle, and he says, Dr. Kaye's village is a mile and a half down that trail. So we pile all trunks the stuff, and trunks packs. and packs and plant presses and everything, chemicals, all the stuff we just pile on yeah. the sand, and the animals are chained, leashed, flying, we have parrots, <laughs> everything, you name it. And we go trooping in to this village. We leave our stuff on the sandbank, go down the trail, and say, we'll talk to Dr. Kai and see if they can put us up. Well, what no, else could they do? it's true that an, a village is a very, a village in nature like that is a very delicate thing. I mean, it had a population of about 32, with Dr. Kai and his wife, 34, well, with us, 40 of the strength, of six of whom are, you know, utterly incredible. I mean, like people from outer space, they just had never seen anything like this. So... Have they seen white men before? Dr. Kaye. But he's Colombian. His he's wife is Colombian. English. Like his wife was English. She turned Very out he weird. was about 34. A Marxist, a woman hater, and a coke addict. Right. A coke A paranoid coke right. coke yeah. chewing the coca. Uh, so uh, like off in the morning, you see him, he's got coca in And a Marxist. And a woman hater. And this tribe and so of people the were women haters. So little Isabella, right, who's this, an so. English girl, an anthropologist in her own right, Horacio tells her that in order to integrate into this society, she has to take the women's role upon herself. And this has to do with pounding mm -hmm. yucca root with stones, <laughs> right? <laughs> and making coca, which the women are not allowed to chew at all. And the men lie around, they bugger the children, and they lie around they in hammocks and listen to transistor radios. And, the, the and chew the coca, and the All women, the and the men never sleep. And the women live with the dogs and the children underneath oh, the, the houses. houses, and the men live in the houses. <laughs> and at five o'clock in the afternoon, the women are. <laughs> at five o'clock in the afternoon, the women are all sent to a, the sleeping place with the children and the dogs, and the men all retire into the big long house for storytelling. And coca chewing until 4:30 in the morning. <laughs> it sounds like a pretty sophisticated society. <laughs> we we live with these people, elbow to elbow. The fart is the most high, the highly evolved form of humor in this society. There are 10,000 variations on the fart and how it may be done, and all are riotously funny to all of these people. <laughs> So, Dr. Kaye was aghast, and I said, Doctor, we're, we're interested in Varola Theodora, the resin. I understand the people here make it into a narcotic, which they call... <gasps> Don't say that word. Do you want to wreck everything? No, 
now listen to me. It was all about, you know, you can't say this word. Although, some of Although it turned it. out Michael Lasky, as we were trooping up from the boat, had said to the guy walking along beside him, Quiere usted ukuhe? Right, and the guy said, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and rushing to the witch doctor. So by the time this warning had been given, everyone and their dog for 50 miles knew that we were after the super secret, never can mention, old men only know about, never tell to strangers, magical drug, right? So Kaye said we could stay there, but it was clear that he was very, very bummed. And so they gave us a house at the edge of the village. And the people were very, and he was nuts, it began to develop. He said we had to say we were all brothers and sisters, mm. because they wouldn't, the people, it would upset their view of social <laughs> relations, if anything else were said. And the people clearly knew, you know, more than Kaye, he was on a noble savage trip, mm. and was trying to protect his Indians from these crazy hippies. and. He, was a, he had apparently been ruling his wife with an iron hand, and we had just walked in on this very just peculiar scene coach. where you know, he was getting more and more wigged out on coke. Stranger and stranger, I would walk along, I would be butterfly collecting in the jungle, and, then, and I would come around a tree, and there would be Dr. Kaye with a wooden spear crouched, and he would... <sighs> I'd say, oh, sorry, doctor, <laughs> excuse me. And he would walk along these trails, carrying a machete, tossing it from hand to hand, and saying, The danger is everywhere. It isn't possible to be too careful. It's in the trees. It's in the bush. It's under the surface of the rivers. It lurks everywhere. Of course, there are snakes and... And he was just, you know, for him, I mean, he lived in a world of nightmare hallucination brought on by coke uh, addiction. And his wife hadn't had any white people to talk to for six months, and she was wondering what's going on, and she wasn't allowed to do coke. And he was just, you know, he was behaving like a Witoto male member of the tribe, just, God, I saw him freak out one afternoon. He was talking to these people. It's a very macho culture, and your woman is always supposed to be right there. And he was talking to these people, and they developed that they needed a machete. And he stood up, and he said, he said, Isabel! And she didn't come. And he said, Isabel! And he, to, and he wouldn't go look for it. He was just standing there, and all these people were standing, looking at each other. And he kept calling, and finally she came, and he was just white. And he was shaking, and he said, Get the machete! And this, so anyway, after about, uh, after about five days or so, <coughs> Sia oh, left. His tooth. His, his tooth was rotting out of his head, and he went, we gave him all the painkiller we had, which was supposed to last us for three months. What and kind of painkiller? It was Sarah's trip. Her oh. father's a doctor. She ran the drugs. It was codeine or second. I don't know what it was. But it was all about getting bearers. And when the man came back from the hunting party, we would get bearers. And it was we wanted to go 110 kilometers. Kaye would tell us almost nothing about this drug. He said, ridiculous. You're not going to get it. These people don't speak Spanish even. They speak only Witoto. There were 40,000 of them killed here 50 years ago. They have no reason to like you. It's super secret. And essentially, you're idiots. What the hell are you doing here? Get out of the jungle while you still can. So we got bearers. And it was four days to this place we were going called La Chirera, which we knew nothing about. All we knew was that on the map of the distribution of this drug usage, it was right smack in the center in a fairly <laughs> tiny area. So there was a big trail called a trocha that went through the jungle, 110 k's, and we got bears, and we crossed it in about three days. And uh, got to La Chirera. It's a mission. But you forgot to tell him you turned back. Oh right, Sia came with us, ah. and I turned him back. Or we, I just the first morning out, I was getting more and more PA, and I decided 
that milk toast or no, I was going to have to break the bubble because it was getting weirder and weirder. He was doing things like he insisted on going first and he was doing things like sharpening sticks and, and putting them. And, he, and for when we were going down the river before we got to El Encanto, we were just smoking dope all the time and he would just sit and stare at me for hours. And hours, and I finally understood that he was probably going to kill me, and that he was completely deranged, and that, strange as it may seem, this was my fate, that I was going to be bumped off by somebody's old boyfriend who was psychotic, who had somehow snuck on to this Amazon expedition. And so we just, I stopped and I said something like that he was the world's most outrageous jackass. In other words, I just pitched the shit into the fan. <laughs> and we were going to punch each other out right there. And Sarah was yelling and <laughs> shouting. <laughs> and the wee Toto bearers were standing Whoa. around open mouth at this freaky confrontation. He decided to turn back. It actually was he had no money. And he was also in terrific pain. And I, I just was, there was no reason for him to be there. He was really nuts. I mean, he was capable of anything. The stress of isolation and bad food makes you do things, strange things. What about taking some coke or something? Would that have killed pain? Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't he know. chewed coke, he, chewed coke, coke I he did some of that. But his mouth was just, being a vet, apparently if you're fruititarian, you can give your teeth about five years and then they just fall out of your head completely and that's it. And he was into that state. So we turned him back. We arrived at La Chirera. After he was turned back, I just had an enormous flood of relief. And we've never and seen him. this trail was beautiful. <laughs> The Amazon jungle, butterflies, birds, and streams running across this trail. We were doing about 25 k's a day, carrying 60 pounds a piece. Mm -hmm. We would stagger it so you would have an hour off, off. and two hours on. Mm -hmm. And it actually was an enormous physical feat. I think that we were already feeling the effects of what's come to be known as the phenomenon but it's impossible to tell. But anyway, I'll get into that. Because we went... We, went, we didn't eat. Right, we, we didn't, didn't eat breakfast. anything. Like the, They announced that we would eliminate breakfast and lunch, lunch. the girls, because they were doing the cooking. And it was impossible to light a fire because the Amazon is so wet. And it was just too much of a chore. So we would get up at 4.30 in the morning, have coffee, have coffee and walk 25 k's till about 3.30 oh. in the afternoon. I can't imagine doing it again ever. Right, we walked it once again the other way, carrying nothing, and it was an ass bust, okay. absolutely, and we were eating. Was it I don't flat know. ground? No, it's up, up and down, down. Oh up and, down. and muddy, and you have to, like, you get to a river and there's no bridge. So you have right. to figure out how to get across. Oh, and you have to keep the porters from stealing everything or running off. Some friends of ours, well, that's another story. But anyway, <laughs> so we get to this place, La Chirera. And our intent was to spend about three months very calmly, attempt to deal with the witch doctors in the area, and by that route attempt to find the Varola tree. And if we couldn't do that, by the taxonomic route, by simply going into the jungle and looking for the tree, because we knew or we thought we would be able to identify it if we were confronted with it. We had a good description of it. Planned to spend three months, and then thought we would leisurely leave, right? So we get there. It's a mission, but it was the not the school time, so there was only a priest, a brother, and two nuns there. So they give us a house uh, on the edge of the mission. We can stay there for two days, for two for a while until the professors come back. Our intent was to build or find a hut in the deep jungle and make our collections from that base. And just you know, it's sort of thing I did in Indonesia. No sweat, just jungle collecting. So we get there. <clears throat> There's a large area of cleared pasture, many many acres of cleared pasture around this. Uh, mission. And Michael Lasky, it, the place is unreal. When we first saw it, there was a rainbow standing over, thrusts up. Most of the Amazon basin is alluvial deposit from the Andes. Uh, 
the river narrows and flows over like into a crack and begins to flow very, very rapidly. And then it flows over an edge, a lip, and there's just a tremendous waterfall. Not exactly a waterfall, but a chute. Uh, it isn't a direct drop, but it's, it's a rapid. Right, right, but exactly. unbelievably violent. Yeah, right, right, exactly. Just rocks, just you know. unbelievably violent, and it's made a big lake, which is called La Chirera Bay or something. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, very unusual situation for the Amazon. Very rarely can you rise can above treetops, but here there were actually hills, and you could get up at altitude, and there were no stinging or biting insects. It's just a paradisical place, phenomenal. I mean, to push that hard and to suddenly there you you're are. there and it's, it's beautiful, beautiful and the mist is drifting across the pastures and there are white cows and mm -hmm. mission and this huge sure. lake and jungle, this and that. But white cows and therein lies uh, a peculiar twist in the story <laughs> because we had come for Varola Theodora but it, it turns out that Strafaria cubensis which is uh, a variety of psilocybin elaborating mushroom, grows, it appears, only in association with sh manure from uh, white Cebu cattle. And they had a herd of about 50 of these white Cebu cattle there. Uh, Michael Lasky went out the morning after we got there into the pasture, and the pasture was full of these mushrooms. I mean, there were hundreds of them. They were everywhere. And, uh... <laughs> and this had been sweeping Colombia. Right, it had been seen in Colombia. I mean, they no. had taken it at Puerto Leguizamo, but I hadn't taken it, or I had taken one, but I hadn't got off. And I have never particularly gotten off on a plant drug, and I just view it as or I viewed it at that time as sort of something for, that you had to be very lucky, that most plant drugs were about being half poisoned and half suggesting yourself into something. So we, we took, uh, they said, we'll take a trip, we'll take a trip tonight, we'll take a trip, we'll take a trip. And so we, in the afternoon we walked out in the pasture and we each took about five mushrooms and we got stoned. And it was phenomenal. I mean, I had never gotten so easily and deeply stoned. It was much stronger than hash. It was, it was like acid, but with no, Physical. no dimension of, of anything you couldn't handle. It was just like you got happy, you were hallucinating furiously, you felt good, and it was <clears throat> you felt good, and. Were there two trips yes. or one? There were the two house. trips. Right. So we took it, and it was great. We there were was all totally... You totally you swim, and that was that night. The light. Was okay. that that night or the yeah. next? That was the first trip. I think so. Right. So, so Michael, Dennis said, after we all got high, he said, well, now here we are. We're in the Amazon jungle. We're here to encounter something which is not rational. Uh, we're smashed on the local dough. Uh, <laughs> We should attempt to contact something which isn't rational. We should attempt, we should choose the most skeptical person and the most uh, suggestible person. Dennis and Michael. No, didn't he decide it would be me and he and I, and Michael and I? Oh, right. And we should send them out into the pasture. It's pitch dark, it's the middle of the night. To send see. them out into the pasture to look at the mushrooms, to, to see, see if they glow. They glow. Because, you know, in, in Castaneda's book, the peyote glow when you're on peyote, or he insisted on this point that you could see across the valley, you could see it studded with glowing peyote. So I said, sure, it doesn't matter. Let's go charging out to the pasture. So Michael and I went out to the pasture, and it was, you know, the fog was drifting, and it was misty, and just very... And here you are looking for cow pies. Right, looking right, for look, cow pies with, with mushrooms, mushrooms. With glowing mushrooms on it. And we're stoned on this very weird drug, which makes you feel very warm and happy and kind of, mmm, psilocybin. And found some mushrooms. Nothing was glowing. <laughs> just wandering around. The drizzle on my glasses, this and that. And then Michael says, 
there's a light, there's a light. And I looked across through the drifting stuff, and there was in fact a kind of a light, a kind of a round light. And uh, so we went back and we told them, this isn't pertinent, I shouldn't waste so much time on it, I should cut through. But anyway, Dennis came out and he and I were there and he saw the light as well. He was stoned and I was stoned, we were falling all over each other. But we couldn't see the house and so it was all about we can follow this light but we better not get too far away or get lost because we didn't know the area at all. We followed it and followed it and sometimes it would seem like it was just you know, maybe 20 feet ahead of us and like it had fallen. It seemed like it was hovering in the air, but then it would seem like it had fallen into the grass and there was this light filtering back through the grass and it would run forward and then it would be again ahead in the air and finally we got way out there and I could, it, it started to flicker sort of and then I saw that it wasn't flickering, that something was passing back and forth in front of it, occluding it. And then I saw, or I thought I saw, that it was someone dancing around a fire in the middle of this rainy pasture. And that was, in fact, I'm sure, what it was. And we just retired in confusion and went to bed. And the next morning I got up, and the most impressive thing about the trip was that it was, it was just great dope, it was just the best dope in the world. I mean, it just seemed like this was what the psychedelic experience is hitting all around. This feeling, this kind of control, but this extremely strange state of reality. So we decided we would do it the next night, the same, the next night, the next day, the next day in the afternoon. And you so know, we did it. Oh, and I was, I was, I had a mortar and pestle, and I was at the same time grinding some up to make snuff out of. And so we took it, and uh, we were all sitting around waiting to get stoned, and there was a lot of nitpicking or between Sarah, and between Sarah and Dennis, who Dennis had not come <laughs> forward as a personality at all <laughs> in this situation. Well, <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Continue. So, finally, you know, he just came, he said, you know, you're pretty weird, and I'm going to tell you why. And I was sort of delighted because he was doing my opinion of Sarah. And I, there was no karma involved for me at all. Somebody else was just wrapping it down to her where she was out of line. And, uh, but then I started, I felt very strange because I felt like Sia. And I said, you know, weird. I feel like this guy. I mean, I don't know what this guy feels like, but I feel like I imagine he must feel. And then... Well, and, Dennis is acting like you. And we were trying to smoke dope, right? And I was saying, you know, you want to hallucinate, push dope, push dope. You know, smoke, would you smoke? And he was fumbling with the matches. And I said, and you know, and he was fumbling and fumbling and fumbling, and I said, what's the problem? Just light the match. Would you light the match? And you know, and everybody was just crossed up, and so we came down. It didn't see, and then the, the, it just seemed strange. And I wanted to pursue it the next day more. But either the next day or very shortly, this Indian guy came and said, you know, my father is a witch doctor, this and you that. Want you want Yahe, don't you? Because that's said, the big drug. That's the big that's drug. The I mean, that's the one you can get it up for the asking. Mm -hmm. Well, this Ukuhe, we <coughs> did dare not mention. But Yahe is. Because, see, at La Chirera, a month or two before we had arrived, there had been a murder between two witch doctors having, in fact, a double a murder and then an attempted murder. And it all had to do with the Kuhe. Supposedly, the shaman who had murdered this guy's brother had painted the top rung of a ladder with this resin. And when the guy had grabbed the top of the ladder, the resin had absorbed through his fingers and he had gotten and dizzy and fallen off. And, and then died. Luciano's wife or son. That's fantastic way of <laughs> right, and so the shaman whose brother had been killed struck back at this guy by 
it was felt this guy's grandmother, mother, and child no. had been in a canoe. Wife, 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 daughter, and wife, daughter, and child had been in a canoe above the Choro, and they had been swept over it, and it was said that this was magic. And the grandmother had lived, but it was said that this old man had tried to kill them magically for doing this. Anyway, it was not the Just time crazy. to be asking about Ukuhe, clearly, because the dead and dying littered the, <laughs> the field. So this guy came and he said, Yahe, a day up the river, this and that. So Kumi and I said, we'll go, because she speaks Spanish. And none of the rest of them did. And so we'll go. We went and we stayed overnight at their maloka, and we got the yahe, and we got enough to get stone, and we got a living plant they gave us. So we came back and to find that we had been told we had to leave this house. And uh, so far, everything seemed more or less normal. The usual amount of hassles, bad karma it was true. We were very lucky to find the mushroom and to find the yahe, but it all seemed more or less, you know, okay. And we moved down to... Uh, but we moved to different houses, right? No, not the first night. We all slept together. Mm -hmm. We moved to this small house they gave us, which was very exposed. And the next, and there seemed to be a kind of distance developing between, which was dividing us into two groups, Sarah and Michael Lasky, and Dennis Kume and I were the two opposing groups. So we spent this night in this small house, and it was very, very uh, leaky. leaky and small. So the next morning, they announced that they were moving to another house, just the two of them, and would leave us there, and we would all cook together there. So that night, we took the mushroom again, and this time I had made up some yahe dust. And I discovered that when you were on the mushroom and you smoked yahe, you, you would have these hallucinations, which it was just like vegetable television. <laughs> I mean, and that's what we said. You just would take a hit and have, you know, a 15-minute cartoon-like hallucination, and then it would fade, and you would take another hit, and it would happen again. And we did this for hours and hours, just delighted <laughs> with the quality of this dope. Okay. So there was no physical come down, no physical trouble getting on. You just take the mushroom, raw or cooked, and 30 minutes later, you know, you're collapsed, giggling uh, where you sit. <laughs> Have you tried snuffing the, uh, the spores of the mushroom? We would we grind it mushroom. and do the whole mushroom. And, and we would make a yahe and mushroom snuff and taste it. Get off. We were snuffing it, eating it, and I said, you know, that it was the perfect dope, and there was no reason to be restrained in any way, and you could just take as much, as much of it as, as you wanted, wanted and this was it. To cut the so then, the next day, it was agreed that we would let it ride a day, and wouldn't get stoned, and the next day we would take a big trip, a big trip, was on. we were experimenting with the dosage, so the next time we'll take a we big trip. We took 25 apiece. Kumi, Dennis, and I took 25 apiece. Michael and Sarah were supposed to come up to, to our house about 3 in the afternoon to get stoned. If that's on the he hasn't missed anything, I've right, just bored just... you to death. Because <laughs> I can't tell a story anyway, but straight. Wait a second.